Thank you for joining us around the fire. For more information or to make a donation, please visit randomactnetwork.com. Now, want to hear a scary story? This episode is brought to you by Bumble. So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall rock climbing Libra, and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. The children were always called Blue Eyes and Turkey. The elder was most like her dear father, who was far away at sea, and the mother would often say, Child, you've taken your father's eyes. For the father had the bluest of blue eyes. When the younger one was still a baby, her loud, rapid gurgling brought to mind the gobble of a beloved turkey that lived near the village. Along with a new baby... The mother and Blue Eyes and Turkey all lived together in a lonely cottage at the edge of the forest. The forest was so near that the garden at the back seemed to be part of it, and the tall fir trees were so close that their big black arms stretched over the little thatched roof, and when the moon shone upon them, their tangled shadows were all over the whitewashed walls. It was a long way to the village, nearly a mile and a half, and the mother had to work very hard and had no time to go herself to see if there was a letter at the post office from the dear father. The two children were very proud of being able to go alone, and when they came back tired from the long walk, there would be the mother waiting and watching for them, and the tea would be ready and the baby crowing with delight, and if by any chance there was a letter from the sea, then they were very happy indeed. The cottage room was so cozy. The walls were as white as snow, and against them hung cake tins and baking dishes, the lid of a large saucepan, and the fish slice, polished and shining bright as ever. On one side of the fireplace, above the bellows, hung the clock that always struck the wrong hour and was always running down too soon. But it was a good clock, with a little picture on its face. The baby's high chair stood in one corner, and in another there was a cupboard hung up high, in which the mother kept all manner of little surprises. Dear children, the mother said one afternoon late in the autumn. It is very chilly for you to go to the village. Don't be long now. Go the nearest way and don't look at any strangers you meet and be sure you do not talk with them. She kissed them and called them dear good children and they joyfully started on their way. The village was gayer than usual for there had been a fair the day before and the people who had made merry still hung about the streets as if reluctant to own that their holiday was over. Hmm, I wish we'd have come yesterday. Then we might have seen something. Look there! Turkey pointed to a stall covered with gingerbread. But the children had no money. At the end of the street, close to where the coaches stopped, an old man sat on the ground with his back resting against the wall of a house. And by him were two dogs. Evidently they were dancing dogs, the children thought, and longed to see them perform. But they seemed as tired as their master, and sat quite still beside him, looking as if they had not even a single wag left in their tails. Oh, I do wish we'd been here yesterday, Blue Eyes said again as they went on to the grocer's, which was also the post office. The postmistress was very busy weighing out half pounds of coffee, and when she had time to attend to the children, she only said that she had nothing for them and went on with what she was doing. Blue Eyes and Turkey turned away to return home, back slowly down the village street, past the man with the dogs again. One dog now sat up rather crookedly, looking very melancholy and rather ridiculous. They had walked some way, and just before they reached the bridge, they noticed, resting against a pile of stones, a strange, dark figure. At first, they thought it was someone asleep. Then they thought it was a poor old woman, ill and hungry, and then they saw that it was a strange, wild-looking girl who seemed very unhappy, and they felt sure that something was the matter. So they thought they would ask her to see if there was anything they could do to help her. The girl seemed to be tall and about 15 years old. She was dressed in very ragged clothes. Around her shoulders there was an old brown shawl, which was torn at the corner that hung down the middle of her back. She wore no bonnet, 
and an old yellow handkerchief which she had tied around her head had fallen backwards and was all huddled up around her neck. Her hair was coal black and hung down, uncombed and unfastened, just anyhow. It was not very long, but it was very shiny, and it seemed to match her bright black eyes and her dark freckled skin. On her feet were coarse gray stockings and thick, shabby boots, which she had evidently forgotten to lace up. She had something hidden away under her shawl, but the children did not know what it was. She did not move or stir till they were within a yard of her. Then she wiped her eyes as if she had been crying bitterly and looked up. The children stood in front of her for a moment, wondering what they ought to do. "'Are you crying?' Turkey asked shyly. To their surprise, she said in an almost cheerful voice, "'Oh dear, no. Not at all. Quite the contrary. Are you?' They felt half a mind to walk away, for anyone could see that they were not crying. Perhaps you are lost? Certainly not. How could I be lost when you have just found me? Besides, I live nearby. The children were surprised at this, for they had never seen her before, and yet they thought they knew all the village folk by sight. What are you sitting on? On a pear drum. The children wondered at the girl's most cheerful voice, for she looked cold and uncomfortable. What is a pear drum? I'm surprised you don't know. Most anyone in good society has one. And then she pulled it out and displayed it for them. The curious instrument was vaguely guitar-shaped, with three strings and two pegs by which to tune them. The third string was never tuned at all, and thus added to the singular effect produced by the village girl's music. And yet, oddly, the pear drum was not played by touching its strings, but by turning a little handle cunningly hidden on one side. But the strange thing about the pear drum was not the music it made, or the strings, or the handle, but a little square box attached to one side. The box had a little flat lid that appeared to be opened by a spring. That was all the children could make out at first. They were most anxious to see inside the box, or to know what it contained, but they thought it might look curious to say so. The girl looked at her instrument with affection. It really is a most beautiful thing, a pear drum. It cost a great deal of money. I am very rich. And this, the children thought, a really remarkable statement, for they had not supposed that rich people dressed in old clothes or went about without bonnets. She might at least have done her hair, they thought. You don't look rich, Turkey blurted in as polite a voice as possible. <laughs> Perhaps not. You look rather shabby. Indeed? Well, a little shabbiness is very respectable. Just ask the others. She picked up the little box by the side of the pear drum, and the children wondered what she meant. Opening it, she spoke inside as if there was someone who could hear her. They've said I look rather shabby. Can you believe it? They don't believe I'm rich. You're not speaking to anyone. Oh, yes, I am. I'm speaking to them both. She looked down at the box in her hands. I have in here a little man and a little woman to match. He is dressed as a peasant and she's in a red petticoat with a white handkerchief pinned across her chest. When I play, they dance most beautifully. Oh, oh let, us do, see. let us see. The children cried with desperate curiosity. The village girl looked back at them with doubt in her eyes, finally saying, I'm afraid that I'm not sure if I can. Why not? Well, tell me. Are you good children? Yes. Yes, yes, Ooh, yes. we are we very are good. Very good. She closed the lid of the box as the children stared with astonishment. That was my worry. I'm afraid it's quite impossible. But, but we are good. We are good. They good. cried again, thinking she had misheard. We are really very good, we promise. Mother always says so. Yes, I heard you before. Then can't you let us see the dancing man and woman? Oh dear, no. They can only be seen by naughty children. Naughty children? children? Oh, yes. And the worse the children are, the better the dancing becomes. I really hoped to share it with you. I really did. If only you weren't so good. It was as if she was accusing them of some terrible crime. She put the pear drum carefully under her ragged cloak and prepared to go on her way. It requires a great deal of skill, being naughty. Well then, good day. And swiftly, she walked away. Will we find you in the village tomorrow? The girl continued on her way, while the children felt their eyes fill with tears and their hearts ache with disappointment.
When their mother saw them, she was greatly astonished, and, fearing they were hurt, ran to meet them. Oh, my dear, dear children, what is the matter? But they did not dare tell their mother about the village girl. They promised that was wrong. But then why are you crying? Poor children, you must be tired and hungry. After tea, you'll feel much, much better. And she went back to the cottage, opening the window to let in the sweet, fresh air, and put the kettle on to boil. After placing the bread and tea things on the table, she called her daughters in a loving voice. Dear children, come and have your tea. But the children made no answer to their dear mother. They only stood still by the window and said nothing. Then Blue Eyes and Turkey turned round, and when they saw the tall loaf baked crisp and brown, and the cups all in a row and the jug of milk all waiting for them, they went to the table and sat down and felt a little happier. And the mother bounced the baby on her knee and sang little songs and laughed, and they thought of the father far away at sea and wondered what he would say to them all when he came home again. Then she looked up and saw that Turkey's eyes were full of tears. My dear little Turkey, what is the matter? Come to mother, my sweet. Come to your mother. Putting down the baby, she held out her arms, and Turkey, getting up from her chair, ran swiftly into them, sobbing. (laughs) Oh, mother. Oh, dear mother. I do so want to be naughty. And then Blue Eyes left her chair also and, rubbing her face against her mother's shoulder, cried sadly, And so do I, mother. Oh, I, I, I'd give anything to be very, very naughty. But, my dear children, why do you want to be naughty? I should be very angry if you were naughty. But you could never be, for it would make me so unhappy. Why couldn't we? The mother thought a while before she answered, and when she did so, they hardly understood, Perhaps because she seemed to be speaking rather to herself than to them. Because if one truly loves, then that love is stronger than all the bad feelings and conquers them. If the love is real, unkindness and wickedness have no power over it. The girls didn't know what she meant, and they continued crying. We do love you! We do! Then wipe the tears from your eyes. But we want to be naughty. Then I should know you did not love me. If we were very, very, very naughty and wouldn't be good, no matter what... I should try to make you better. But if you couldn't? The mother's eyes filled with tears, a sob almost choking her. If you wouldn't be good, no matter what, I should have to go away and leave you. You couldn't. Yes, I could. But it would make me so unhappy. But we must have a mother. We're only children. I'd send you a new mother with glass eyes and a wooden tail. But I will never leave you as long as you love me. We won't be naughty. We'll be good. We should hate the new mother, and she should never come here. And they clung to their own mother and kissed her fondly. But when they went to bed, they sobbed bitterly, for they remembered the little dancing man and woman and longed more than ever to see them. But how could they bear to hurt their own mother in that way? Good day. Blue Eyes and Turkey approached the girl, who was once again sitting by the heap of stones. It was as if she had never moved from the day before. The weather is really charming. The children took no notice of her greeting. Are the little man and woman there? Of course. They are both here and quite well. The little man tips his hat to the lady. It is so romantic. And the little woman has heard a secret. She tells it while she dances. The children begged to see. Quite impossible, I assure you. You are too good. But mother says if we are naughty, she will go away and send home a new mother. Indeed, that is what they all say. What do you mean? They all threaten that kind of thing. But I fear you could not be naughty even if you tried. Please show us, and we will be so naughty when we return home. Certainly not beforehand. But if we are very naughty tonight, will you show them to us when we return? Questions asked today are always better answered tomorrow. The girl turned round and walked on. For a few minutes, they stood still looking after her. Then they broke down and cried. Turkey was the first to wipe away her tears. Together, all the way home, they planned how to begin being naughty. And that afternoon, the dear mother was sorely distressed. 
for instead of sitting at their tea as usual with smiling, happy faces, they broke their mugs and threw their bread and butter on the floor. And when their mother told them to do one thing, they carefully went and did another. And as for helping to put away, they left her to do it all by herself and only stamped their feet with rage when she told them to go upstairs until they were good. We won't be good. We hate being good. We like being naughty very much. Don't you remember what I told you I should do if you were very, very naughty? There is no mother with a wooden tail and glass eyes, and if there were, we should just stick pins in her and send her away. But there is none. Then the mother's sadness became anger at last, and she sent them off to bed. They spent the night laughing with joy, jumping in their beds, and singing merry songs at the top of their voices. The next morning, without asking, the children got up and ran off as fast as they could over the fields towards the bridge to look for the village girl. She was sitting, as usual, by the heap of stones with the pear drum under her shawl. They told her the things they had done and how angry their mother had been. But the girl kept the pear drum carefully hidden. We were very naughty. So naughty we were sent to bed. If you were really naughty, you wouldn't have gone to bed at all. But, you see, you can't help it. It takes such skill to be naughty well. But we broke our mugs and... We dropped our bread to the floor. The kitchen was foul. Mere trifles. Did you throw cold water on the fire? Did you break the clock? Did you pull all the tins down from the walls and throw them on the floor? No! exclaimed the children, aghast. We could not do that. I thought not. So many people mistake a little noise and foolishness for real naughtiness. Well, good day. And before they could say another word, she had vanished. So the children went home and did all the things she said. They threw water on the fire. They pulled down the baking dish and the cake tin, the fish slice and the lid of the saucepan and banged them on the floor. They broke the clock and danced on the butter. They turned everything upside down. And then they sat still and wondered if they were naughty enough. And when the mother saw all that they had done, she did not scold them as she had before. She just broke down and cried and then looked at the children and said sadly, My poor blue eyes and turkey, what has become of you? Unless you are good tomorrow, unless you show me that you love me, I shall indeed have to go away and come back no more. And the new mother I told you of will come to you. They did not believe her, yet their hearts ached when they saw how unhappy she looked, and they thought within themselves that once they had seen the little man and woman dance, they would be good forever afterwards. The next morning, before the birds were stirring or the flowers had wiped their eyes ready for the day, the children crept out of the cottage and ran across the fields. They did not think the village girl would be up so very early, but their hearts had ached so much at the sight of their mother's sad face that they had not been able to sleep, and they longed to know if they had been naughty enough— and if they might just once hear the pear drum and see the little man and woman dance. To their surprise, they found the village girl sitting by the heap of stones, and they noticed that the box containing the little man and woman was open, but she closed it quickly when she saw them. They excitedly told her everything they'd done. The girl looked at them curiously, then drew the yellow silk handkerchief that she sometimes wore around her head out of her pocket and began smoothing out the creases in it with her hands. You seem really quite excited. But the girl only went on smoothing out her handkerchief. I am so very particular about my dress. They could hardly listen to her in their excitement. We have been so very naughty, and Mother says she will go away today and send home a new mother if we are not good. Indeed, there is an endless variety in language. The things people say are so singular and amusing. The children did not understand. But if she goes, what shall we do? People go and people come. First they go, and then they come. Perhaps she will go before she comes. She really couldn't come before she goes. Oh, you had better go back and be good. You are really not clever enough to be anything else. But we did all the things you told us. You didn't throw the looking glass out of the window or stand the baby on its head. No, we didn't do that. I thought not. Well, good day. I shall not be here tomorrow. Please just let us see them once. Well, I shall go past your cottage at 11 o'clock this morning. Perhaps I shall play the pear drum as I go by. And will you show us the man and woman? Quite impossible, unless you really deserved it. 
Make-believe naughtiness is only spoiled goodness. It's a waste of time, I fear. But of course, I should not like to interfere with you. Eleven o'clock, I shall be quite punctual. I'm very particular about my engagements. Then again, the children went home and were naughty. Oh, so very, very naughty that the dear mother's heart ached and her eyes filled with tears. And at last, she went upstairs and slowly put on her best gown and her new sunbonnet. And she dressed the baby all in its Sunday clothes. And then she came down and stood before Blue Eyes and Turkey. And just as she did so, Turkey threw the looking glass out of the window, and it fell with a loud crash upon the ground. <laughs> Goodbye, my children. Goodbye, my blue eyes. Goodbye, my turkey. Oh, my poor children. <laughs> Weeping bitterly, the mother kissed the children and took the baby into her arms. The new mother will be here presently. It seemed as if the children were spellbound and they could not follow her. They opened the window wide and called after her, but the mother only looked round and shook her head, and they could see the tears falling down her cheeks. They cried and cried, but still the mother went across the fields. Just before she could no longer be seen, she stopped and turned and waved her handkerchief, all wet with tears, to the children at the window. She made the baby kiss its hand, and in a moment, mother and baby had vanished from their sight. Then the children felt their hearts ache with sorrow, and they cried bitterly, just as their mother had done. And they could not believe that she had gone. Surely she would come back. They thought she would not leave them all together. But oh, if she did! And then the broken clock struck eleven, and they looked at each other while their hearts stood still. And they rushed to the open window. They saw the village girl coming towards them from the fields, dancing along and playing the pear drum as she did so. Behind her. Walking slowly was the man with the dogs, whom they had seen on the first day they met the girl. He was playing a flute with a strange, shrill sound, and after the man followed the two dogs, slowly waltzing round and round on their hind legs. We have done all you told us. Blue Eyes called when she had recovered from the astonishment. Come and see. The girl did not cease her playing or her dancing, but called out above the music, "You did it all badly." You threw the water on the wrong side of the fire. The tin things were not quite in the middle of the room. The clock was not broken enough. You did not stand the baby on its head. But our mother has gone away. Show us the little man and woman now, and let us hear the secret. The girl was just in front of the cottage, but she did not stop playing. The sound of the strings seemed to go through their hearts. She did not stop dancing. She was already passing by the cottage, and still the man followed her. Playing shrilly on his flute, and still the two dogs waltzed round and round after him. On they went, all of them together. The children ran from the house, begging the girl to stop and show them the dancing couple. She turned around, still dancing to the music, and held the box out before them. The little man and the woman have gone away. See, their box is empty. And then, for the first time, the children saw that the lid of the box was raised and hanging back, and that no little man and woman were in it. But our mother is gone. Will she ever come back? The girl turned and continued on towards the long road leading out of the city. No, she'll never come back. I saw her by the bridge. She took a boat up on the river. She is sailing to the sea. She will meet your father once again, and they will go sailing to countries far away. The children cried out, but could say no more, for their hearts seemed to be breaking. Then the girl, her voice getting fainter and fainter in the distance, called out once more to them before vanishing altogether. Your new mother is coming. She is already on her way. The children looked at each other, and the little cottage home that only a week before had been so bright and happy, so cozy and so spotless. The fire was out. And the tins and dishes and bits of bread were all lying on the floor, and there was the broken clock, no time on its face. There was the cupboard on the wall, no sweet surprise on its shelf, and the baby's high chair, but no little baby to sit in it. In the midst of it all stood the children, looking at the wreck they had made. I wish we had never seen the village girl at all. Surely mother will come back. She knows we shall die if she doesn't come back. I don't know what we shall do if the new mother comes. I shall never, never like any other mother. We won't let her in. We will bolt the door and shut the window, and we won't take any notice when she knocks. 
So they bolted the door and shut the window, and all through the afternoon they sat watching and listening for fear of the new mother. But they saw and heard nothing of her, and gradually they became less and less afraid lest she should come. When it was dinner time, they were very hungry, but they could only find some stale bread. Then they thought that perhaps when it was dark, their own dear mother would come home, and she would forgive them. And then Blue Eyes thought that when their mother returned, she would be very cold. So they crept out the back door to gather wood, and at last they made a fire. With the fire burning bright, they began to be happy again, and to feel certain that their own mother would return. And the sight of the pleasant fire reminded them of all the times she had waited for them to come home from the post office, and of how she had welcomed them and comforted them and given them nice warm tea and sweet bread and talked to them. Oh, how sorry they were they had been naughty, and all for that nasty village girl. They did not care a bit about the little man and woman now, or want to hear the secret. They fetched a pail of water and washed the floor. They scrubbed the tins till they looked bright again, and, putting a footstool on a chair, carefully hung the things in their places. And then they picked up the broken mugs and made the room as neat as they could. They took down the tea tray and got out the cups and put the kettle on the fire to boil, and made everything look as homelike as they could, till it looked as if their dear mother's hands had been busy about it. At last all was ready, and Blue Eyes and Turkey washed their faces and their hands, and then sat and waited. The children had fallen asleep, and the fire was dim and low when a loud knocking at the door woke them at the table. Their hearts stood still as the terrible knocking rang again. They knew it could not be their own mother, for she would have turned the handle and tried to come in without knocking at all. The new mother is here. What shall we do? We won't let her in. And again came a loud and horrible knocking at the door. We won't go away! The awful hammering continued. Blue Eyes, in fear and trembling, put her back against the door as Turkey went to the window, peeping out. She could just see a black satin bonnet with a frill around the edge and a long, bony arm carrying a black leather bag. For a second, she swore she saw the flashing of two glass eyes. What shall we do? The door shook and rattled with the terrible knocking. Afraid it would break, Turkey joined with her back against the door, and the rattling stopped. For a long, terrible moment, all was still. Perhaps the new mother had made up her mind to go away. And then, with a fearful blow, the little painted door was cracked and splintered. With a shriek, the children darted from the spot and fled out the back door into the forest beyond. All night long, they stayed in the darkness and the cold, and all the next day, and when the darkness had fallen and the night was still once again, hand in hand, Blue Eyes and Turkey crept back to the home where they were once so happy, and, with beating hearts, they looked through the window. The mother was at the stove. Her long, heavy wooden tail thumped into the cabinets as she turned blinding the children with the glare of her cracked glass eyes. The New Mother, told by Dana Maisel, featuring Joyce Cloudin, Hannah Mary Simpson, and Ashlyn C. Hafer, adapted from the story by Lucy Clifford.